Hi. Um, now, this is um, uh, a discussion on the section of 6.5, which was mutually exclusive events. You'll find a lot of associations with Chapter 5 when we covered the section on Venn diagrams. And Venn diagrams, remember, consists of a big rectangle which symbol symbolizes the universal set or the set of all sets. And then we have one or more sets inside uh, that box. And these sets are described as circles and all members of that set fit inside that circle. And we have a circle for A and a circle for B. So elements which are in the set A belong to set A and elements which are in set B belong to set B. But there are some elements that have the features of both set A and set B. Let's suppose, for example, but let's say that we have odd numbers here and multiples of three here. And multiples of three that are odd would then belong in the intersection between A and B. So for situation number one, that's what this is. It's the non-mutually exclusive case where we do have the, that these sets, for example, these sets A and B cannot be separated because there are members that the two sets have in common. So if we had to describe the set A or B, then we would have to say that this is equal to the set A plus the set B. But if we add the set A to the set B, we are actually double counting the members in the intersection. So we, then we have to take away the, uh, the overlap, which we call A and B. A and B has to be subtracted from A or B. Okay, well, in terms of counting, we, all, we often use the notation N, at least in the textbook, we use the notation n, and n of a or b just follows the same formula. That's n of a plus n of b minus n of a and b. Okay, so n of a or b is the, the number of elements in a or b. In other words, the number of elements in in both sets taken as the union of two the union of a and B, we can also, of course, why not use set notation? A union B is equal to the number in set A plus the number in set B, subtract the intersection, number in A intersection B. Now that's a little easier to read, uh, especially in the context that I have to cram my handwriting uh, toward the end of the page. But this is actually the set theory notation for it. But of course, you can use and and or. Or has or is taken to be the union, and and is taken to be whatever members of sets contain features common to both A and B. So if we if we were to take the probability for the non mutually exclusive case, the probability that that we have a member in in either A or B, A union B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B subtract the probability um, that we have uh, something in the intersection. So we're subtracting A intersection B and that's precisely for the reason that we are not double counting the intersection. If we recall, now I guess maybe you might be asking yourself where does the, where does P of this, that, and the other thing come from? Well, the probability of success or the probability of some event happening that you like, for example, the probability that some event belongs to the set A, <coughs> is really the number of members in set A divided by the number of members of the sample space, meaning that the number of ways, using maybe some counting technique of some kind, the number of ways an event can turn out to be a member of set A divided by the number of ways that any out could any uh, that the same event could come out to anything at all okay so that's basically it so if we do P of A union B 
using this notation, then we're going n of a over n of s plus um, uh, n of b over n of s subtract n of a u, uh, a intersection b over n of s. Well, this can also be n of a union b divided by n of s. Is that if we take these to be the probability formulas for each of these terms, then really this is how we get that's how we get from here to here. That's situation number one. So this is the non-mutually exclusive case, and we're saying that the probability is computed this way. Okay, so that's that's really the important takeaway from situation one. Let's just show you both sets. So you can see the sets are separated. There is no intersection in this case. This, this is situation number two for non-mutual exclusion. So to get your head around this phrase mutually exclusive, we can look at this, this situation and we can see clearly, unlike this situation, there are some members of set A that belong to set B, and there are some members of B that belong to set A. But look over here. There are some members of A, well, actually, there are no members of A that belong to set B, and there are no members of B that belong to set A. That's what we mean by mutually exclu exclusive, right? Mutual exclusion means that, you know, if you're, for example, uh, if you had to separate the uh, sets of numbers into odd and even numbers, into positive and negative numbers, you can, I think, wrap your head around the fact that there is no even number that's odd, there is no odd number that's even. Similarly, there is no negative number that's positive and no positive number that's negative. There is no such thing. Okay, so that's situation number two for mutual exclusion. So. The idea is here that this is a much simpler uh, approach that really we're just saying P of A, oh sorry, P, <laughs> oh yeah, so P of A plus P of B, I guess we can do it this way, P of A plus P of B is equal to P of A or B. Notice we have P of A or B here, really P of A union B and P of A or B here, but it's a different formula because this situation here, the non-mutually exclusive situation includes an intersection. This one does not have an intersection, so we simply leave the term out. The other way of writing it is P of A union B is equal to P of A plus P of B. And that's the mutual exclusion formula for probability. So notice that um, what you learned about Venn diagrams in chapter five kind of come back again. Um, I want to take a I want to take a look at this problem on page 338. And the problem is asking what is the probability that either a heart or a face card is selected from a deck of cards? Here we have a nice diagram of a deck of cards. The face cards are highlighted in yellow. The hearts are in a different color. Hearts below a jack are in purple, but are kind of a lavender color. And this jack, queen, king, the face cards, the heart face cards, are in some other color, kind of a greeny, a light green color. So we can take a look at that so the hearts are here and the face cards are here. You can accept the fact that because of this, there are some hearts that are face cards. But not, but not, all, not all of the hearts are face cards. Three, there are numbers from ace all the way to ten that are not face cards, but the jack, queen, and king are face cards. So what is the probability? Remember, there are 13 cards in a suit. There are four suits. 13 times 4 is 52. There's 52 cards in a the deck. There are 13 hearts. 
but only three hearts that are face cards. So if you have either a heart or a face card, you can't just say 13 plus 12, because there's like 12 face cards in the deck, 13 hearts in the deck, but you can't just do 12 plus 13, because some of them are an overlap. So you end up having to do 12 plus 13, but subtract 3, because you double counted the intersection. And that way you get, well, 12 plus 13 is 25, take away 3, you actually have 22 cards in the deck. 22 cards in the deck that will result in the favorable outcome asked for in the question. 22 out of 52 will be your probability. And you can simplify the fraction to 11 over 26. Okay, so um, we're going to uh, l take a look at a problem on um, page 341. Number six, it says a market research firm monitored a thousand television viewers, meaning that um, they took a sample of a thousand TV viewers. You consider that the sample space of the study, consisting of 800 adults and 200 children, to evaluate a new comedy series that aired for the first time last week. Research indicated that 250 adults and 148 children viewed some or all of the program. So if one of the 1,000 viewers were just selected at random, there were three questions that were asked. First of all, what's the probability that it's an adult that did not watch the show? What is the probability that it is a child that did watch the show? That's the intersection of children and watchers. And what is the um, and this is the intersection of adults and those who did not watch. That's what the bar means over the W, is the complement of the set W, right? Uh, and what is the probability that either it's an adult or someone who watched the show? So someone intersection watch. So, okay. An adult, meaning that it could be an adult who did or did not watch the show, but here we have someone who did watch, meaning either an adult or a child. The easiest way to answer this question is through a Venn diagram. My Venn diagram was as simple as possible. I used a two-circle Venn diagram, and um, I'm going to fill it out for you as follows. First of all, um, you might be wondering where the adults are in this universal set. It turns out that if you're not a child, you're an adult. So adults are just anything that does not belong to the set of children. So that's how I treated this. Then I had watchers, people who watch the program. Well, anyone in this area does not belong to the set of children. Therefore, these must be adults who did watch the program, whereas these are children who watch the program, okay? And these are, what would you think? These would be the adults who did not watch the program. Um, I've seen this in the solution in the book. I find the solution kind of wonky. I feel that, I feel rather passionately that my solution is far more straightforward and it shows a little more of an understanding of sets. But the, the scheme shown in the book shows um, a three-circle set, which is probably the kind of solution you might have intuitively attempt, attempted, where the adults would be a third circle. The problem is you're going to end up with a lot of empty space. There's a lot of empty sets in that scheme. This one, every, the, everything here gets filled in with a number, and I'm still able to answer all of the questions um, correctly. So let's start filling out the spaces. Now we told we have 200 children and 148 of those children watch the program. So the 148 must go here. Those are the children that watch the program. Now, what about the children that didn't watch the program? Well, that must be 200 subtract 148. So you do 200 
subtract 148 and you get 52. So I, I guess 52 children didn't watch the program. What about the adults? How many adults watch the program? Well, we're told point blank what that number is. It's 250 adults. We're given that in the problem. So because the this region is the walk, people who watch the program that are outside the children, these must be the adults. So I can put 250 there. Now what about what goes out here? Well, we had 800. Now, okay, first of all, check to see that this accounts for all of the children. This number plus this number should add up to 200 because we, we started off with 200 children and 800 adults, so this should add up to 200. Well, 250 and some number out here should equal 800 because we were told 800 adults participated in the survey or in the study. So if I do 800, 800 take away 250, I get 550 adults who did not watch the program. So the first question is rather straightforward to answer. Remember, we, we selected a random person. We didn't know if it was an adult or a child out of the 1,000 people. What is the probability that, in the first question, that we have an adult who did not watch the program? Well, right away, we can see exactly how many adults did not watch the program, but this is not a probability. This is just a number. Probabilities are numbers that go between 0 and 1. Probabilities are fractions. They never go above 1. So please do not tell me that the probability is 550. There's no such number in existence for probability. You cannot go beyond 100% or 1 if you're using decimals. So 550 out of 1,000. We, we have 550 viewers out of 1,000 possible. Right? That's the probability that that person would be an adult who did not watch the film. Express as a decimal, it's 0 0.55. If you want to add the 0 there, because we have a third digit here, put a third digit there. What about the probability that we have a child who did watch the program? Well, right straight away, we can read that right off the diagram. Children who watch the program number in on the order of 148. We put 148 here out of 1,000, and we have 0 0.148 as the probability that we have a child who watched the program. What about an adult or someone who watched the program? Well, okay, now the someones who watch the program must be the sum of these two numbers. So we have here 148 plus 250. 148 plus 250 plus 550 plus 550 and then we get 948 and we divide by a thousand we get 0 0.948 so in this case we answer with 948 out of a thousand which equals 0 0.948 and that's pretty much how you do that question